might seem attractive more than multiple fronts. Um, so thanks all, thanks, uh, thanks all of you for coming. Uh, my name is Eric Calderwood. Uh, I want to thank Susan as well for the invitation to come and talk to you guys. Can you guys all hear me in the back? Yeah, it's volume more or less okay? All right, so I'm honored to participate in this lecture series, which so far I think has been really exciting, both for the students and the faculty who have been here. In fact, I think one sign that our lecture series is really hitting it is that we now have, I think, a baby somewhere here in the crowd. That is. So we're reaching new audiences. And if that baby grows up to be like a speedback or something, I'd like, I'd like to have some kind of attribution. <laughs> so my, my commission today is to talk to you about my field, uh, post-colonial studies, and that is what I'm going to do. Uh, I'm going to try to cover a lot of ground. Ooh, I see that the, there's a significant... Okay. Where's, where's the uh, volume situation? This would just take one moment. In the meantime, there is a, a handout that went with the... Is it better now? Okay. Uh, th there was a handout that I passed out with the presentation. I hope that there were enough for many of you. It seemed like I might have run out. If that's the case, I apologize. Hopefully you can look on with someone. Um, uh, the handout is simply what I'm going to be showing up here in the PowerPoint slides, and it's meant to help you follow along and jot down questions as I go along. And uh, on that topic, uh, I just want to encourage you to interrupt me at any moment if you want me to clarify anything I've said. Uh, very happy. Obviously, I'm also going to leave time for a Q&A at the end, but I'm more than happy for this to be a conversation and not just a lecture. So please just throw your hand up if you want clarification on anything. Okay? All right. So my goals for today are fairly, fairly straightforward. I'm going to try to answer this question. What is post-colonial theory? What are post-colonial studies? What is that field? And I'm going to be relying mostly uh, on the readings from uh, Saeed and Spivak to answer that question. The bulk of my lecture is really going to be on that first question up there, and I'm going to be kind of drawing a lot of my ammo uh, from those two, first two texts that were assigned. Uh, I'm also going to try to, as I go along, try to make some cases for how uh, post-colonial theory fits into the greater scheme of this course. I'm going to try to make connections with things that we've seen already, uh, especially with Derrida and Foucault, actually especially with Foucault, so thank you very much for setting it up so nicely. Uh, and I'm also going to try to see if I can start to open some doors on conversations we'll be having later in the semester about feminist and queer theory, indigenous studies, critical race theory. So, in short, my goal is going to be both to try to present some of the central concerns and questions of post-colonial theory, and also use post-colonial theory as a sort of pivot between where we've been so far and where we're going in the course. So as I said, that's, uh, you know, to say one, two, and three is a little misleading, because that's really kind of 80% of the talk. Towards the end of the talk, I'm going to kind of pivot and see if I can address what I, what I think are some of the current problems in the field. So if I'm going to be using Saeed's feedback to sort of set up a classical sense of what post-colonial theory is, I'm going to be using then the Anzal Duo reading to push against that a little bit and suggest what some of the uh, current debates and questions in the field are. And then finally, in the conclusion, I'm going to try to make an assertive claim about why you should care about post-colonial theory. And I should say, why you should care even if you don't study colonialism. Uh, I'm going to try to make the case that this should matter and could matter to you no matter what you study. So that, that's the conclusion. So as a first step to, uh, I don't want to click so I'll have to come over here from time to time. As a first step to post-colonial uh, theory, I thought that I would just provide some simple, or not so simple, but at least straightforward definitions that I pulled directly from uh, the anthologies from which I signed those readings uh, for today. Uh, the first one, uh, most of the readings came from the Norton Anthology of Theory and Criticism, which uh, I'll, I'll normally be referring to it as NATC on the slides uh, for short, and also the Rutledge Reader of Postcolonial Studies. So uh, the reason I want to give you these definitions, well, there are a few. One, I want you to see how major scholars in the field have defined it, its questions, its concerns. Uh, second, I kind of wanted to give you a, a, a going away present, like something short that you could take with you, and in the future, if you have to look up one paragraph, what is post-colonial theory, well, this is, this is a pretty good shot at it. I don't know if I could have done better myself. Um, 
And thirdly, I'm also going to be both, I'm going to be arguing from, but also to some degree against some of the things in this definition. And so I'm kind of setting it up as a prop that's both a launching pad, but also a catalyst for debate uh, about some of the issues that we're going to discuss as I go along. So let me, uh, and this, in, it was mainly for some of these definitions that I gave the handout, because I wanted people to have something they could jot notes on if they had specific things they wanted to talk about. So here's how the Norton editors describe the field of postcolonial studies. Postcolonial studies is an interdisciplinary field that examines the global impact of European colonialism from its beginnings in the 15th century to the present. Broadly speaking, it aims to describe the mechanisms of colonial power to recover, to recover excluded or marginalized subaltern voices and to theorize the complexities of colonial, neocolonial, and postcolonial identity, national belonging, and globalization. So, hopefully by the end of this lecture you'll understand every word <laughs> in that definition, and you'll also have some grounds for contesting them, potentially, or for kind of giving your own version of what postcolonial theory is. Uh, to that end, I wanted to give you a proviso. So the Rutledge says something very similar, and then it adds the following proviso which I thought was significant for what I'm going to say today. So this is from the Rutledge. We would argue that post-colonial studies are based in the historical fact of European colonialism and the diverse material effects to which this phenomenon gave rise. We need to keep this fact firmly in mind because the increasingly unfocused use of the term post-colonial over the last 10 years to describe an astonishing variety of cultural, economic, and political practices has meant that there is a danger of its losing its effective meaning altogether. In particular, and this is going to come up later, the tendency to employ the term post-colonial to refer to any kind of marginality at all runs the risk of denying its basis in the historical process of colonialism. Okay, so these are, these are the definitions that are going to be kind of our starting point and also some of the things that we're going to try to come back to and revise as the lecture goes on. And as I read them, instantly I have several questions that kind of rise to the surface. Uh, the first one is, what is the colonial, or what is colonialism? The way I phrase it up there is how capacious or limited is that category, the category of the colonial? Both the Norton and the Rutledge editors seem very intent on tying colonialism in this category of the colonial to what the Rutledge editors call the historical fact of European colonialism. The Norton definition shares this emphasis on European colonialism and then kind of takes it one step further or projects it onto an even broader cam uh, canvas by saying it's talking about the global impact of European colonialism from its beginnings in the 15th century, so that would be the Iberian empires, Spain and Portugal, to the present. So the Norton editors are not only kind of focusing here again on Europe and European colonialism, but also trying to draw a line between European colonialism and the present, and in particular what they're calling globalization, which, you know, we can already say there's already a tension rising here, right, because that globalization is something that comes chronologically long after or somewhat after colonialism. It's usually tied to the neoliberal policies of the 1980s and 1990s. So we have this, we have this very broad question. How far in space and in time can we stretch this category of the colonial. Um, one way of kind of breaking that down into a smaller, pe uh, a smaller piece might be through geography. Where? Where is the colonial? Where is the post-colonial? What is the, the map of the post-colonial? That question might seem kind of unnecessarily abstract and not that interesting, but let me put it in a more concrete way that might start to bring to the surface some of the tensions here. What is gained and what is lost by bringing into comparison places as disparate as, say, Canada, Mexico, Morocco, and India. What are the, the similarities and discontinuities there? If we acknowledge that all of those places are in some way post-colonial, in the sense that they were once uh, controlled or part of European empires, then how are their post-colonial experiences similar, and how are they different? Are they all equally post-colonial, or is one more post-colonial than the other? Mm, certainly, at least, academic practice would suggest that some places start to seem to be more, more post-colonial than others. 
And so we're going to have to kind of probe that and see why that might be. So the location is difficult to pin down. Something that seems very easy, okay, the historical process of European colonialism starts to introduce very significant fissures once you start to pull away at that. So if it's really difficult to kind of pin down the location of the colonial and the post-colonial, it's also really difficult to pin down the temporality. When, when is or when was the post-colonial? Did it already happen? Are we still in it? Uh, you know, the Norton Enders, they state very confidently that they're going to look at European colonialism starting in the 15th century. And you, it's very easy to just kind of breeze by that and say, okay, of course, the 15th century. But all of a sudden it begs a bunch of clarifying questions, right? So how is the 15th experience, the 15th century experience of territorial expansion of the Iberian uh, <coughs> empires, how is that categorically different from what came before? Why them and not the Roman Empire? Why not the Moroccan Al Almoravids taking over part of Europe? Why is that not colonialism? Uh, it, you know, it's, it, we have to kind of probe that question. So that's from the beginning. And then we also might want to ask, is the 15th century colonialism the same as the 19th century colonialism? Can we draw a very clean and kind of easy line between, say, Cortez in Mexico and uh, Napoleon in Egypt? And if not, why not? These are some of the questions uh, we're going to kind of try to debate and tease out in the lecture. The main point I'm trying to draw out is that these concepts, the colonial and the post-colonial, are always going to be subject to some kind of push and pull. There's going to be people who are going to want to make them as capacious as possible, and there are going to be people who are going to want to draw out their limits by suggesting the very real differences in, the, in colonialism across space and time. And part of what I want you to be thinking about, and part of what I'm going to try to talk about, is what is gained, once again, and what is lost? What, what are the advantages of making colonialism really, really big? And what are the, colonialism, what are the advantages of saying, well, there is no such thing as one singular post-colonial because everything is so different, and we might as well talk about very specific contexts. So this is, in, in some sense, the debate between kind of specificity and, and generality, but with a very uh, kind of unique, the unique uh, manifestation of that within the context of colonialism. So I want to talk about this post, the post and post-colonialism, both because I think it's important for understanding what people mean, and because I think we're going to be hearing a lot of posts as we go along, right? Post-structuralism, post-modernism, post-capitalism, post-industrial. We're going to hear a lot of posts, and uh, it's important to know well, what does it mean when we talk about the post. So I'm going to be talking mostly about what I, how I understand the post and post-colonial, but I do think it carries over conceptually to the other posts. Uh, you're going to be hearing about in the in the semester and in your work going forward. So the easy the easy thing would be okay. The post means after, right? But I'm going to say uh, that actually the post this prefix this troublesome prefix is a a helpful site for thinking about this tricky temporality of what the postcolonial is. Um, some people have thought of it as chronological, so signaling after, after colonialism, which would be kind of maybe the most literal meaning of it. But other people have thought of it as more of a kind of epistemic marker, that is, shifting beyond the systems of knowledge and power that made colonialism work. And before I build on that, what would it mean for the post to be epistemic? It's really important that we define this term and make sure that we're all on the same page. Uh, Beruz defined it really brilliantly last week in his lecture on Foucault, so this is going to be a uh, review for many of you, but I, but I also know that there are new people and new faces each, each uh, week, so I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. So I'm going to be talking about the epistemic, which is a really important term and idea that post-colonial theorists have taken from Foucault. And literally it just means, epistem literally just means knowledge, basically, in Greek. But Foucault, as I put up there, he, he, he uses it in kind of a specialized way. Foucault, and this is, this is kind of the Norton's spin or their gloss on what Foucault means. He means the underlying structure of knowledge and beliefs during a historical period. I put my own definition up there, not because I think I can necessarily do better than the Norton, but because I think it's helpful for you to try to translate things into your own words. And that's an instinct that I've been trying to kind of encourage the students in my own seminar to do. So I thought of the epistem as a kind of horizon, a horizon of what is knowable and thinkable in a given historical period. So when Said and Spivak talk about the epistemic effects of colonialism, and we're going to see them use this word going forward, 
how they're talking, what they're talking about is how did colonialism shift, sometimes violently, the structure of knowledge within colonized societies. Okay? So that's my that's kind of my parenthetical on the epistem. So let's come back to the post, because I was saying it can mark either a chronological shift, so after colonialism, or it can mark a sort of epistemic shift beyond colonialism. And that leads to a kind of ambiguity, right? Which, which post are we talking about when we say post? For some people, that ambiguity kind of detracts potentially from the utility of the term post-colonial. But many scholars have seen that ambiguity to be productive rather than debilitating, opening up possibilities to think about, as I say, these practices of representation and power that circulate across the barrier in between uh, colonial rule and decolonization. So I'm going to be using uh, the post to mean something that is kind of temporally after but not over, something that is after but and yet still structured by what comes before. And I think that thinking about that practice of the post might help you to think about some of the other ones that I'm sure are coming up in your seminars, such as postmodern, and we could just fill in the list from there. Okay, so these are that's my kind of introductory remarks. Here's my here's my closing nugget for my introduction, which is I'm just going to conclude with one word, which is resistance. I found it really provocative. Is Bob Parker here? Bob Parker was awesome. Anyone, if Bob Parker ever gives his lecture on structuralism again, you should go. It was incredible. Uh, or not lecture, his emphatically not lecture, his conversation about structuralism. But basically he came in and said, I'm going to define structuralism in one word. Um, and it was comparison, i.e. we only understand one thing in relation to another thing. And it was kind of cheeky, right? I mean, obviously, uh, you're setting yourself up for any sort of critique when you do that. But at the risk of collapsing very important differences, I'm going to take that same leap, the Bob Parker leap, and I'm going to say, if, if I were to describe post-colonial theory in one word, that word would be resistance. Post-colonial theory, broadly construed, seeks to identify and examine the mechanisms of colonial power and to propose strategies for resisting them. Resistance. So if I were to turn that into question form, I would say post-colonial theory asks, how do we trace the consequences of colonialism and the legacies of colonial power? And what are meaningful modes for combating or resisting them? So I'm trying to give you a few different ways that you can get at this idea of post-colonial. One of them, which you can later decide whether it works for you or not, is to think of resistance. Resistance is going to be a kind of recurring theme in my lecture. So I'm now going to move on to what is a little bit kind of like the prehistory of Said and Spivak. All right, so most of my time I'm going to be with Said and Spivak, but I want to say something about post-colonial theory before Said and Spivak. Excuse me. And I'm going to do that by saying a few things about the brief, uh, the four-page reading on national culture from Franz Fanon. Just a quick, a quick, a quick show of hands, if no shame at all. Did anyone have the chance to read Fanon? All right, we have a few. I, it, was, it was recommended, so I'm not going to dwell on him for long. It was just important for me to know. Uh, I am going to kind of say a few things about him, because I'm, I'm hoping he can set up what are some of the distinctive contributions of Said and Spivak. So this, this extract, this text that we read, is, is a part of uh, Fanon's The Wretched of the Earth, which was published in 1961 in French. Fanon was born on the Caribbean island of Martinique, in uh, 1925. At the time, Martinique was under French colonial rule. And later in life, Fanon became a really active member of the Algerian struggle for independence, the Algerian struggle against French colonial rule. So this is a sort of trans-colonial intellectual whose life trajectory took him from the Caribbean to France to North Africa, where he ended up dying. A standard account of post-colonial theory might start with Fanon or at least with Fanon or other intellectuals who, like Fanon, participated in the struggle, the decolonization struggles that spread throughout the colonized world in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. So when I say that Fanon and his contemporaries participated in the decolonization struggles, what do I mean? What is the arena? What's the point? What, where does the rubber hit the road? What is the arena for their struggle? What does anti-colonial resistance mean for Fanon. Well, in a phrase, it means national liberation. 
This may seem really obvious, right? We're starting with colonialism. What does that mean? We want to decolonize. This is going to seem obvious, but later it's not going to seem that obvious. So let me let me walk walk us through it a little bit. Fanon says, and this is from the Wretched of the Earth, to fight for national culture means in the first place to fight for the liberation of the nation, that material keystone which makes the building of a culture possible. So this quote really exemplifies Fanon's clear emphasis on this idea of anti-colonial fight. And indeed, the armed struggle for liberation from European colonialism is a centerpiece of Fanon's thinking. And he thinks that colonialism will only come to an end through violent anti-colonial struggle. I also want to highlight his use of the word material here, which uh, hopefully should be kind of ringing off bells in your heads from previous weeks that we've been doing, because I think that this really signals his commitment to the Marxist idea of historical materialism, the idea that material forces shape consciousness, not the other way around. So social economic forces shape consciousness and not the other way around. This might seem a leap to you, but I, I, I can bear it out by having read more of the Wretched of the Earth. But this is part of a larger program in which he has a sort of material, I would say a material understanding of what colonialism is and how you fight it. Now, to be sure, Fanon understood that colonialism had both material and epistemic consequences. Um, later in the same text, he says, colonialism is not simply content to impose its rule upon the present and the future of a dominated country. By a kind of perverted logic, it turns to the past of the oppressed people and distorts, disfigures, and destroys it. So this quote anticipates the problem that Spivak is later going to call epistemic violence, which is a phrase that I'm going to return to uh, later in the lecture. According to Fanon, and this is kind of his early take on what epistemic violence is, Colonialism not only dis distorts the present through political and economic domination, it also distorts the past because the European colonizer disfigures the colonized nation's pre-colonial history. So Fanon is really foreshadowing, he died actually before Algerian independence, but he's foreshadowing a problem that's going to become very real after the decolonization struggles. Namely that decolonization will not be sufficient in some ways, to liberate colonized nations from the logic of colonial rule. Post-colonial subjects will have to decolonize or liberate history itself, or subjectivity itself. So there is an epistemic dimension to what Fanon is saying. There is, he does understand that colonialism is working on multiple levels. But I do want to emphasize that for him, kind of, well, as I said, where the rubber hits the road, what he gives pride of place is the idea of struggle, and specifically the armed struggle against colonial rule and the material necessity of national liberation. The reason I'm emphasizing this is that a later generation of post-colonial theorists, the one that we're going to be focusing on mostly today, Said and Spivak amongst them, focus, I would say, less on the material consequences of colonialism and more on its epistemic consequences. Okay? And that shift in focus from the material to the epistemic is what I'm going to call the discursive turn in post-colonial studies. <laughs> By this, I mean a turn toward an understanding of colonial power that focuses on the production of knowledge and also on the institutions in which knowledge circulates. So for example, uh, and I cited and Spivak, as I said, are representatives of this trend. So there, I'm trying to set up a contrast here of from moving from the material to the epistemic in what post-colonial resistance is about. So a discursive approach to the analysis of colonial relations might say, for example, colonial violence does not just leave its mark on territories or on institutions. Rather, it also resounds on the level of discourse. So this discursive turn, this, this turn from the material to the epistemic, responds in part to the problem I said Fanon was already foreshadowing, that decolonization did not resolve or fix colonialism. It did not fix the structural problems that the legacy of colonialism had left behind. Indeed, post-colonial thinkers recognized that liberating the nation from post-colonial rule was not enough. They also had to decolonize the subject. They had to decolonize the archive. 
they had to free them or liberate them from the distortions and disfigurations, the disfigurements that Fanon had complained about and already foresaw as being a problem. So I'm going to use Edward Said as kind of a pioneering approach from the move from the material to the epistemic and what I'm calling the discursive turn. Said is really someone who was a pioneer in this approach to the study of colonialism. His book, Orientalism, is really, it's all about this. It's about the discursive grounds upon which the West exercised and asserted its colonial power over the rest of the world. And in particular, he examines how the West constructed an image of the Orient, which means here roughly the Middle East, though we can talk about that. He means roughly the Middle East, as we would call it now. How the West constructed an image of the Orient as its shadowy other. Um, Said argues that through the binary opposition of Orient and Occident, the West justified its political and epistemic mastery over the world. Okay? So that's, that's one kind of discursive state. The, the, the next author we're going to be talking about is Spivak, and in her essay I think that she's kind of extending Said's exploration of the discursive grounds upon which colonialism worked. She's asking us to listen to the voices, the subaltern voices, we're going to return to that word subaltern, the voices that have been effaced from the record, the historical record of Europe's colonial encounter with India. And at the heart of that essay, for me, is a challenge. And it's a challenge that is at once hermeneutic, methodological, and also ethical. How do we listen to the silences of history? Indeed, can we listen to the silences of history? Therefore, if I'm going to venture an initial comparison, and I'm going to try to bear this out in more detailed readings between the two, I think what Said is doing is he's illuminating one of the discourses that made colonialism possible. Whereas Spivak is meditating upon the discourses whose very possibility was occluded or negated by the fact of colonialism. Now before I go deeper, I'm going to see if I, this kind of comparison, I'm going to see if I can tease that out with some, some nice quotes from those texts to make sense of that. But before I go any deeper into those analyses, I should just say from the beginning, I encourage you all to have a little bit of healthy um, suspicion or you know, to, we shouldn't all take for granted the fact that post-colonial resistance is grounded in discourse rather than in material experience or in revolutionary activity. I, don't, I wouldn't want to elide what is actually a very significant shift in thinking about it. To, to see if I can kind of draw that into more real-life comparisons, I would ask you to think, what are the differences between, say, the Algerian War of Independence, in which Fanon was deeply involved, and this lecture that I'm giving to you in the comforts of a beautiful uh, lecture hall here in, in, in Lincoln. If you see those to be different exercises, then you might want to think of it, but, but, and yet I'm arguing that they're both, in some sense, engaged in this project of resistance. I, I encourage you to think about that. You know, I'm talking about a discursive turn, that's where I'm going to spend most of my time, because that's where I think post-colonial studies has moved increasingly. But we shouldn't take for granted that that is the best, or certainly not the only, form of responding to colonialism. <clears throat> okay, I'm now going to focus for a bit on Said's Orientalism. Does anyone have any questions about what I've said so far? Another thing on this discursive turn, I think something to think about is, I mean, I, I think one of the reasons that it works so well is that it really puts scholars back on the front lines of post-colonial struggle. I mean, discourse is our bread and butter. And that is, you know, if, if we can't fight in the war, we can fight in the war of discourse. It kind of turns us into heroes. And so I both want, mean that to be an invitation for you to join the struggle and also for you to be skeptical from the outset about what are meaningful modes of resistance. So I'm going to talk about Orientalism, Said's Orientalism, which is a book that's been very influential for me, probably uh, of all the books that we're reading this semester, the, one's been, the one that's been most influential to me personally. And that's because I, I work on European colonialism in the Arab Islamic world. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm sort of humbled to, to present this work to you. In the tradition of Foucault, Said's book is really interested in the intersections of power 
and, and knowledge. And specifically, how did academic knowledge, a specific kind of academic knowledge, which is Orientalism, how did it contribute to the consolidation of colonial power? And also, Said is asking, how did Western representations of the Orient contribute to the project of European colonialism? My discussion with Said is going to attempt to respond to those questions and also to see if I can tease out the connections between Said and Foucault. So before, I mean, I wouldn't say before, to, in order to respond to those questions, I think we need to unpack the term that is at the center of the book, the term that gives the book its title, Orientalism. What is Orientalism? How many of you had heard the term Orientalism before reading Said? Okay, some, some had. I mean, something to consider is, is Said has sort of overdetermined what Orientalism is. This is not a word he invented, but he, fun, he fundamentally altered its semantic field. Um, and so I'm going to give you a sense of what, what Orientalism meant before Said, and what in some sense it can no longer mean because of Said. And this is really uh, what, what he, he gives us a few different definitions, and he's trying to build up and saying that these definitions are interdependent. The first one that he gives, and this is what, what Orientalism might have first signified to someone before Said, is Orientalism was and is, I'll show evidence of that, was and is an academic discipline that emerged in the 19th century. Said says, the most readily accepted designation for Orientalism is an academic one. And indeed, the label still serves in a number of academic institutions. Anyone who teaches, writes about, or researches the Orient is an Ori Orientalist. And what he or she does is Orientalism. So, I'm an Orientalist. Not really, but, 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 but in, in some ways, according, according to that definition. So if, if Orientalism is an academic discipline, then where, you might ask, is the Department of Orientalism at the University of Illinois? Is there a Department of Orientalism at the University of Illinois? No. Why? Why do you think that is? Anyone? Why is there not a Department of Orientalism at the University of Illinois? It's the office of the chancellor. It's the move to administer it. <laughs> Fair enough. I, I stand corrected. Uh, if, you, if you want to go over to the provost's office and the chancellor, you might find Orientalist practices. Um, the, the reasons that there really isn't a, a department of Orientalism at the University of Illinois, it's you know it's twofold. You know the the term has really fallen out of fashion as a descriptor for an academic field, and one of them is the practical reason that it was deemed just far too broad. It, at one time, encompassed everything from India all the way to Morocco, and everything from ancient Mesopotamia up until the present. And it just became too unwieldy to be actually a field of academic inquiry. But really, that, it wasn't the weight of that that broke the back of Orientalism. It was really Said's book itself, Orientalism, which really uh, demonstrates the extent to which that field was implicated that academic field was implicated in Europe's colonial expansion and domination of the Arab Islamic world. But before we pat ourselves on the back and congratulate ourselves for having moved on from, from Orientalism, I do want to suggest that the term still lingers amongst us in some academic venues. Actually, just this week as I was preparing this lecture, I got an invitation to re uh, review a manuscript for a major journal in my field, which is Denta, Journal of the Economic and Social History of the Orient. And likewise, uh, Europe's, probably Europe's most important institution for studying the languages, cultures, and history of the Middle East, amongst other places, is SOAS, the School of Oriental and African Studies. And so, uh, Said's first definition, which is an academic discipline that emerges in the 19th century, that's what, the, what he means. And it's mostly gone, but it still lingers with us. So I want you to think about the kind of long shadow that this uh, disciplinary name has cast. From there, Said moves to a second definition. So he says, the first and, and most obvious one is that it's this field. You might have heard of Orientalists. And then he kind of moves up in order of complexity. And he says, Orientalism is, and I quote, a style of thought based upon an ontological and epistemological distinction made between the Orient and, most of the time, the Occident. So this is a lot harder than the first definition. I think we can all agree. Uh, first of all, to see if we can understand it, I think we're going to have to see if we can define ontology and epistemology. I did that up there, so ontology, 
kind of roughly the study of being, and epistemology, the theory or study of knowledge. And uh, if you were reading, if you guys, I think most of you were reading from the Norton text. The Norton actually glosses this phrase, and this is how they gloss it. They say, Orientalism is a style of thought based upon a difference in the essential being of the Orient and the Occident, that's the ontology, and in how they are known, that's the epistemology. I might have glossed this phrase uh, slightly differently. I might have said, Orientalism is a style of Western thought based on the total alterity of the Orient, that's the ontology, and based on the total superiority of the Western colonizer. Because uh, in Orientalism, academic knowledge, it's, it's precisely knowledge that is the source of power. And so, for me, he's saying, Orientalism is a style of thought based on total alterity of the colonized subject, total superiority of the colonizer. And it's from this definition, and it's what he calls its traffic with the first one, the traffic in between Orientalism as an academic discipline and Orientalism as a style of thought, that emerges the third definition, which is the one, uh, in some sense, is the main definition, it's the one that's going to structure the rest of Said's book. And here it is. Taking the late 18th century as a very roughly defined starting point, so he's saying, starting with the Napoleonic invasion of Egypt in 1798. And I say that because we should be very careful in considering what, uh, what turn, how, how uh, Said places Orientalism in space and time. So he's saying, starting with Napoleon in Egypt in 1798, Orientalism can be discussed and analyzed as the corporate institution for dealing with the Orient, dealing with it by making statements about it, authorizing views of it, describing it by teaching it, settling it, ruling over it. In short, Orientalism as a Western style for dominating, restructuring, and having authority over the Orient. So this, this third definition is, is, this is the motor behind Said's book. This is, this is what he means when he says Orientalism. But he does go through the work to say, this isn't a term I've invented. It has this, pre, it has this prehistory. This is how I'm going to use it. I hope that when you read this passage, or if you haven't read it yet, when you saw this quote, you had your Foucault bells ringing off in your head, going, woo, -hoo -hoo -hoo, you're Foucault. Because Foucault's footprints are really all over this definition, I think. Um, one of the things that's at work in this passage is what Foucault calls knowledge power, which is the term that Foucault uh, kind of creates to describe how the production of knowledge is always wedded to power. Another thing that Said is building on is Foucault's idea of productive power. You might remember that one of Said's main, uh, one of Foucault's main arguments is that power is not just negative and repressive, rather it's also productive in the sense that it produces the very categories that it then strives to regulate. So this is what Said is kind of playing with here, this idea of Orientalism being a kind of productive power. And let me see if I can kind of translate that into Foucaultian terms to make more sense of it. Western knowledge, Western knowledge produces a category, the Orient, and it then, uh, which it then seeks to dominate and regulate through the knowledge power of Orientalism. So this is a, that it, this is a category that is at once produ is produced by the very discourse that is used to control it. So that's a very kind of Foucaultian methodology that Said is using. Here's another passage where <clears throat> Said is kind of using very explicitly the language of productive power to talk about Orientalism. And I'm doing this a little bit to kind of show you the genealogy of Said and how post-colonial theory, it has a kind of vexed relationship with Europe because it's drawing very significantly for some European conceptual tools to criticize Eurocentrism. Eurocentrism. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. So this is what Said says. It says, Orientalism responded more to the culture that produced it than to its putative object, which was also produced by the West. That is, the Western imaginary produced the Orient and then produced a series of authorized statements and ideas to talk about the Orient. <coughs> and Said locates Western colonial power in the formation and deployment of this kind of discourse, discourses like Orientalism. And it's precisely for that reason that Orientalism, and, and this, is, this is really important to understand, so he says Orientalism doesn't really tell us anything about the Orient. It tells us about the culture that produced the Orient. This is, this is what he says in this quote. I myself believe that Orientalism is more particularly valuable as a sign of European Atlantic power over the Orient than it is as a British discourse about the Orient. 
which is what, in its academic or scholarly form, it claims to be. So it's important to keep in mind here that for Said, both the Orient and the Occident are not, as he says, inert facts of nature. He contends that neither the East nor the West is an essence. They have no ontological stability, using a term we just saw. They have no presence, Derrida might say. In colloquial speech, we might say there's no there there. Okay? He's saying that both the West and the Orient are discursive constructs, and that the West needs the Orient, indeed that the West produces the Orient, in order to have a sign against which to define itself. Okay? I should mention, uh, while I'm kind of in the mode of defining what Orientalism is, that Orientalism was also a school of European art. And I noticed that later Oscar Vasquez, Oscar, could you give us love, who's going to be giving the lecture on visual studies, actually assign an article that talks a bit about the politics of Orientalist art. So I encourage you to start to make some connections as you come along. In what ways might the gaze itself be a tool of colonial domination? In what ways can looking, just the act of looking, be part of the colonial system? So hopefully we're going to kind of see a connection there when Oscar gives his lecture. All right, so Orientalism has been incredibly productive for the field of post-colonial studies. Uh, one of the most influential books, mostly because it charted this path, right, for, for analyzing the intersections between academic knowledge, colonial discourses, and power. But the book has also spawned a sort of cottage industry of critiques, all right, so it's, well, which always happens. I mean, the, when you make people really angry, usually that's a sign that you're on track. Um, so, I just wanted you to know, just kind of in one, this is, this is uh, kind of 30 years of responses to, uh, to Said in one slide, but I, I think we could boil down the critiques of Said into kind of two major schools. The first critique has to do with how Said theorizes the West, and the second has to do with his theorization of the East, or the Orient. So in this first line of critique, several scholars have complained that Said does seem to tacitly assume that there is such a thing as a unified West that is somehow the origin of discourse, the discourse then structures the rest of the world. And so they're accusing Said of a sort of monolithic idea of the West, even though he's saying it's just this discursive conduct. And indeed, if you read the book, even though he talks very broadly of Orient and Occident, he really only draws all of his examples from four places, Britain, France, Egypt, and the Levant. So he sort of universalizes France and Britain as kind of universal standards for what, for what the West is, just in the way that he kind of universalizes Egypt and the Levant as standards for what the East is. So people have asked, aren't there in fact multiple Orients and multiple Occidents which vary across space and time? That's been kind of like one, one like, that's the first major question that people pose to Saeed. And the second one is, what about the Orient itself? What about and I'm using that term, once again, kind of cheaply. No one uses it, uses it that word. But what, what about non-Western representations of the West? In some ways, it might be a kind of unfair critique, because Said says very openly, this is a book about Western representations of other parts of the world. But people say, well, is there such a thing as Occidentalism? Like, what about the other side of the representational coin, as it were? And if you say that Orientalism is a project that's wedded to colonial power, what would, what would be the ideological contours of, say, Occidentalism? How, 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 if, uh, what, what, what kind of project is that, would that be tied to? Is there such a thing as Occidentalism in the way there is uh, Orientalism? So I'm happy to go into greater detail into each of those lines of critique in the Q&A, but I want to make the jump now from Said to Spivak. And I'm going to do so with just this one point, which is that Orientalism is an example of what Spivak calls epistemic bias. Okay, so this is, this is the bridge I'm trying to build between Orientalism and can the subaltern speak. The Norton editors, they define epistemic violence as the forcible replacement of one structure of beliefs with another. Personally, I think we could define the term in even simpler, uh, simpler ways. I think, for me, epistemic violence is the way the West uses knowledge to exert colonial power over the rest of the world. And Orientalism would be one mode or one example of epistemic violence. And in fact, for Spivak, epistemic violence is the definition in some ways of colonialism itself. She says, uh, really, I think in the opening paragraph of the text we read, 
The clearest available example of such epistemic violence was the remotely orchestrated, far-flung, and heterogeneous project could constitute the colonial subject as other. This quote suggests several connections between Spivak, Said, and Foucault. First of all, Spivak is building on Foucault's idea, once again, of productive power. She's saying colonialism constitutes or produces the colonial subject that it then strives to regulate. <clears throat> but for Spivak, colonial power doesn't only produce the colonized subject, it also produces it specifically as an other, an other that fixes the centrality of the colonizing power. So as, as I was saying, I think Orientalism might be one example of what Spivak calls this heterogeneous project to constitute the colonial subject of other. And I gave myself this sort of mad lib um, challenge of translating Said into Spivak. Uh, so so this, is, this is how they do it. The West produces or constitutes the Oriental subject, and then it produces discourses to delimit and define the Oriental as the West's other. So that would be kind of one way that we can mad lib uh, Said's thinking into Spivak's formulation. Uh, I want to give another example of epistemic violence, because I really think that is one of the ideas that's at the core of her essay. And this is one that's actually taken from her essay itself. Uh, it's an 1835 document on Indian education in British uh, colonial India. And it says, I quote, We must at present do our best to form a class who may be interpreters between us and the millions whom we govern. A class of persons, Indian in blood and color, but English in taste, in opinions, in morals, and in intellect. To that class, we may leave it to refine the vernacular dialects of the country, to enrich those dialects with terms of science borrowed from the Western nomenclature, and to render them, notice that word, render them by degrees, fit vehicles for conveying knowledge to the great mass of the population. So this passage from Macaulay's Minute on Indian Education exemplifies how Western institutions of education were implicated not only in the production of colonial subjects, but also in the consolidation of colonial power. Note that Macaulay, he doesn't talk about we need to find a class. He says, we need to form a class of Indian subjects whom the English will render, quote, fit vehicles for, for conveying knowledge to the great mass of the Indian population. So in other words, Macaulay's statement shows how, and to draw on Foucault again, how these colonial institutions of education really were conceived of as tools of training or as discipline that were meant to render the subject, the colonized subjects docile purveyors of a certain kind of knowledge. So this is another attempt to see if I can draw connections between uh, Spivak and Foucault. So that's, that's kind of my bridge between Said and Spivak, um, which is epistemic violence. I now want to see if I can take a step back and just talk about Spivak's essay, Can the Subaltern Speak on its own terms? So sort of out, outside of what Said is doing. And to do that, I think we should just start with the title itself. It's a real, um, it's kind of a quagmire. Um, you know, I, I think the four-word title contains two enigmas. It's sort of a deceptively simple title, right? And in some sense, the one that seems really difficult, which is who or what is the subaltern, I think ends up being less challenging than the second one, which is what is speech? <laughs> You'll notice with it that it's the, the most dangerous things in these theoretical texts is when people use words that you think you know in ways that you're like, what, is, what does that mean? And so uh, in order to address this text, I think we're going to have to say what or who is the subaltern, and then what is speech? And then there's this corollary question which I've thrown up here, which is, how can we learn to listen to the silences of history? How can we learn to listen to what history does not, or potentially cannot, say? These voices that have been effaced from the historical record. So let's, uh, let's see if we can attack this first question, which is, who is the subaltern, or what is the subaltern? I'm saying who or what because I think I'm going to be leading, leading eventually to the point that the subaltern is more of a what than it is a who. Hopefully, hopefully that point will become clear in a minute or two. Spivak's essay, she is building on the work of a group of radical Indian historians known as the Subaltern Studies Group. And she describes, she actually addresses this group very explicitly in, in the essay that we read. And she describes their work in the following terms. Their project is to rethink Indian colonial historiography 
from the perspective of the discontinuous chain of peasant insurgencies during the colonial occupation. So for, for Spivak, uh, in Guha and in other historians, so Guha is kind of the, the founding figure of this group, other historians associated with the subaltern studies group, the subaltern is the peasant insurgent whose voices and struggles have been left out of Indian historiography. So far, so good, I think. But what, what's really key here to, to drive home is that this omission of historiography and this problem of representation was not fixed by decolonization. They're not saying only the colonial, the colonial writers didn't pay attention to these pension insurgencies. They're saying, no, no, in fact, this is an omission that is true both before and after uh, independence. So in some ways, the, both Guha and Spivak are speaking to the problem of what we now call post-colonial elites, who are uh, you know, people who inherit and perpetuate the structures of colonial rule. And in particular, in this case, the epistemic structure of colonialism, an epistemic structure who excluded certain events and certain people. So Guha, Guha and Spivak are accusing certain nationalist Indian historians of, in some sense, replicating exclusionary practices that were part of the colonial epistem. So Guha, she's building on this. So this is, this is kind of where she's taking this turn. But she's moving it in a new direction. Like Guha, she's interested in recovering voices that have been effaced from the historical record. But she focuses in particular on the figure of the subaltern woman, who she says is doubly effaced. That's, that's her word. So she's theorizing subalternity. She's taking this debate that's already happening in uh, Indian studies, and she's theorizing it as a specifically gendered form of muting. She's interested in exploring how certain historical and ideological conditions have conspired to mute or silence some subjects, and in particular, women in colonized societies. So I'm. I, I'm, I'm kind of walking us down this road, but now I need to kind of throw up a proviso that is a warning here, because it would be very easy to think, oh, okay, so the subaltern is, is a woman, or is a colonized woman, or is an illiterate woman in rural India. And no, that's not, that's not actually what it is, because for Spivak, although she's very interested in these intersections between gender and power, the subaltern is not so much uh, an, an identity as it is a predicament. It is, is a certain relationship to power, a certain situational relationship to power and discourse. It's the predicament of, sub, of subjects whose voices cannot be heard, of subjects who are radically obstructed from discourse. And this is how uh, Spivak puts that point. Simply by being post-colonial or an ethnic minority, we are not subaltern. That word is reserved for the sheer heterogeneity of decolonized space. Okay, so clear enough. No, not really. No, I'm just kidding. So sheer heterogeneity, right, is, is one of the defining hallmarks of the subaltern. But what does that mean, right? What, 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 what does that mean? It, so in my seminar, we've uh, kind of with an eye towards starting to think about final papers, and this is a methodological aside, we've been starting to think about how do you argue with theory? How do you use, uh, how do you, um, talk about theory in an argumentative mode. What are the grounds upon which you can engage these texts critically and insert your own voice? And for me, uh, and, and this is mostly you know, directed to people who are taking the seminars, one of the best ways, or one of the first ways into theory is through key terms and concepts that are characteristic of certain theorists or certain schools of theories. And they're usually not neologisms, they're not necessarily new words, but rather words that are used in new or unfamiliar ways. So for Foucault, that might be power. For Derrida, that might be play or presence. For here, one way to start to engage, if you're starting to think, what was I, how would I write a paper about Spivak? One way might just be to look at this, this, this one phrase, sheer heterogeneity, and say, what does she mean by that? What is the relationship between heterogeneity and subalternity? So I'm going to give you my take, but it's not meant to foreclose debate, because it's, most of the debating about Spivak has to do with that specific formulation. Um, my take is that she's saying that she reserves the term subaltern for the subject whose radical difference will not merely serve as the shadow that defines the dominant center. That is to say, the subject who will not be subsumed in the self-other binary. 
I've said that subalternity is not an identity, but rather it's a predicament. It's also, I think, a situational relationship to power. And by that, I mean the subaltern is that which lies beyond the horizon of the colonial epistem. So that's how I understand. I think, I think Spivak and I, would I, I've never spoken with her, would agree the subaltern is a, is a predicament, not an identity. I'm not sure if she would agree with that specific formulation, but I encourage you to think about it on your own. I'm thinking about the subaltern as that which lies beyond the colonial epistem. So here's my cheeky rejoinder to Spivak's essay. Can the subaltern travel? So we've got can the subaltern speak, and now I'm saying can the subaltern travel? And what do I mean by that? I mean, to what extent is the category of the subaltern helpful for analyzing and thinking about post-colonial cultures and experiences outside of India, outside of the context of India? For example, I could just start with a like, very easily, empirically verifiable fact that subaltern studies has played a huge role in recent, in recent Latin American studies, but has actually played relatively very little role, relatively less role, I should say, in African studies, both North African and Sub-Saharan African. That would be easily verifiable by any library search. The question is why? Why is it that this is an idea that catches on in some contexts and not in others? Have you heard of the subaltern in the, in the context you study? If the answer is yes, you might ask why. If the answer is no, you should also ask why. I have some ideas about this, and we can maybe, since we're, you know, I'm running a little bit over, um, I'm, I'll share them in the Q&A. But in any case, I think that the take home is not merely to replicate Spivak's theorization of the subaltern, but rather to take up the spirit of the essay, which is to ask, what are the voices and experiences that have been effaced from the record of the, colonial con of the, of the cultural context you study? Who or what is the subaltern in the context you study? That's something uh, for you to think about. I'm going to jump over my next uh, brief section, which was uh, making some connections between Spivak and Derrida, and then also from Foucault, who, mostly in the spirit of time, because I want to make sure that we have time for questions and answers. The one thing I will say from this, the kind of quick summary of this section, is I think Spivak shares Foucault's interest in the forces that help to produce the subject, that help to produce knowledge. But she takes issue with, she thinks that Foucault fails to acknowledge that the Western subject is not a universal subject. And she also takes issue with uh, Foucault's failure to address the constitutive role of gender in the formation of, uh, of subjectivity. So in some ways, she, we can say that she's kind of worlding and also gendering uh, these post-structuralist debates on subjectivity. And this is part of this larger post-colonial uh, program, which is the critique of Eurocentrism. That is to say, uh, showing the ways in which certain European thinkers take principles, take their principles to be universal principles, rather than products of a specific cultural and historical milieu. But I think that there's kind of a vexed issue here, right? Because I, I think that post-colonial theory is sort of inside, outside, and against European intellectual history, because it is both arguing against Eurocentrism, but often doing so using the very, uh, some very critical tools that were developed within the European context. And so that vexed relationship, I don't think it can be resolved, but at the very least it should be kind of put out there and probed. So I'm going to move now to what I consider to be current debates in post-colonial studies. I've kind of tried to go show the trajectory that goes from the material to the discursive terms. And now I want to say something about where I think the field is now. If I were to summarize current debates and problems in the field of post-colonial studies, I would boil them down to one phrase, which is the location of theory. Where is it produced? Who produces it? How is it used? Many scholars in the field uh, today are currently wondering or and worrying, is post-colonial theory neo-colonial? That is to mean, does post-colonial theory uh, reconstitute the map and structures of colonial domination? What do I mean by that? Well, I, we could say, for example, that the readings we did from today took us from India to the Middle East to the U.S.-Mexico border from the 19th century up to the 1980s, or we could just say we read three texts that were written in the U.S. And in the context of Said and Spivak, two texts that were written in prestigious Ivy League universities. And so 
the question, this is the problem that I'm calling uh, the location of theory. That postcolonial studies has tended to rely on theoretical discourses generated in privileged Western universities and then uh, exported or deployed in some sense to analyze and sometimes even kind of add value to uh, non-Western cultural, uh, cultural text. So there's this sort of very uncomfortable dynamic of uh, Western privileged discourses sort of adding value to the raw materials of culture happening other, other places in the world. So there have been a number of problems uh, to this. I mean, a lot of people see this dynamic, and there are a number of ways of getting at how do we solve this problem, right? So one of them is, what if we reverse the directionality of post-colonial theory? What if we use thinkers of the global south to theorize the cultural production of the global north? Is there a way to do this without making uh, sort of cultural agents of the global south speak through somehow the legitimizing framework of the Western university? That's kind of one, one way that people are trying to think about can we, can, we, can we kind of relocate where, where we're looking for theory? Another one has been a renewed emphasis on the transcolonial. So a new, a new, another response to this issue of how is post-colonial theory generated and deployed has been a renewed emphasis on what I'm calling the transcolonial. And by that I mean these, uh, an emphasis on these lateral movements of culture and subjects that are connecting post-colonial subjects and somehow uh, skirting or circumventing the metropole. To take an example from my own work, a sort of classic post-colonial study of Morocco, which is what I work on, would be Morocco in relation to its colonizers, France and Spain. A trans-colonial approach might be uh, a focus on cultural exchange between Morocco and Palestine in the 1930s. And so, this is another way that people would love this is another way that people are kind of remapping the, the directionality in the map of theory. And the idea behind this, I mean, one of the, and I think I put this up there, yeah, that this has kind of emerged from this critique that potentially post-colonial studies has put too much emphasis on the vertical power relationship between the colonized and the colonizer. And the transcolonial, in some ways, is meant to be a framework in which minority subjects can identify themselves vis-a-vis -vis each other, rather than solely in opposition to a dominant discourse. So that's, that's one response. Another response is what I'm going to call uh, other colonialisms. And this is another field of innovation right now, which is what about projects of um, what, are proje what about projects of territorial expansion or political domination that originate outside of Europe? Is there such a thing as a non-European colonialism? Are there pre-modern colonialisms? The two books uh, that I put up here are both from a University of California press series called Other Colonialisms that's engaged in this problem. And most of the books in that series are engaged with Japanese colonialism in East Asia. And so that's another, another question is, to what extent is it helpful? How, how far geographically and temporarily, tempor uh, temporarily can we extend this idea of colonialism? So these are a few ways of kind of skinning that cat, this problem that I've said, the location of theory. For me, the most interesting and perhaps the most ambitious is rethinking what theory is itself. Rethinking where theory is made, what constitutes theory. So increasingly, scholars in the post-colonial field are looking for theory in new places. And I don't just mean by that new geographic locales, like, oh, let's see if Japan also had a colonial experience, but actually looking at different kinds of practices, different kinds of texts. Might we look at creative work, creative texts, as a site of potential theorization. And really, that's the reason why I wanted to assign Anzal Dua's kind of genre-bending borderlands, La Frontera. Because, you know, I wanted you to ask, is Anzal Dua theoretical in the same way that Derrida is theoretical? And if so, what would it look like to use Anzal Dua uh, to read, say, a canonical Western text like Don Quixote or Ulysses? So I'm going to transition now to Anzal Dua, because you know, these, these are kind of the questions I'm going to be probing in this last section. Um, and you know, one of the things that is both most challenging and most satisfying about Anzal Dua is that uh, her use of code switching, right? Her effort to sort of provincialize or queer English by um, joining English together with long, untranslated passages of Spanish. 
Uh, and in some sense, to translate Anzaldúa into a monolingual text is to miss the point of her entire writing project. But at the same time, I want us to be all like more or less on the same page as we discuss her bilingual aesthetics and politics. I kind of, it's it, pedagogically, it's difficult to know what to do with that aspect of Anzaldúa. So I just wanted to open up the floor now. Does anyone want to ask any comprehension questions about the Anzaldúa text before I make some kind of more argumentative points about it? Yeah. Can you, can you provide translation for that? What was that? Can you provide a translation for that quote here, if possible? The quote, this quote right here? Yeah. Well, I'm not, um, I'm not going to translate it. Okay. <laughs> I, well, I could, I could. I mean, I, like, native land, this is home, the small towns in the valley, the little towns with chicken pens and goats picking into mesquite shrubs. I've missed the hot nights with air, nights of fireflies and owls making holes in the night. Um, but there are a few things here, because uh, she also has a very non-normative use of Spanish. One of the things about Anzatua is that, um, and I've discovered this reading her, that I have a more normative sense of Spanish, a language I learned as a second language, than I do of English. That I, I read her and I say, oh, that's not really how you would say this in Spanish. And so it's a, it's a sort of in-between speech that alludes that eludes translation, eludes various normative practices of translation. And I think that's kind of what makes it interesting. And Anzaldúa precisely wants someone who doesn't understand the text to feel that discomfort of not being at the center of the text, of not being at the center of her practice. So in some sense, doing what I just said flattens that effect. But at the same time, and this is the give and take of teaching Anzaldúa, it puts everyone at a structural disadvantage if you don't do it. And so if there are more questions, uh, you can bring them up as we go along. Um, but I'm, I'm going to be kind of using Anzadua as a, a, a point of inflection to start my conclusion of the talk. Um, and I think that she's a, a fitting place to move toward a conclusion because her text, uh, for me, places post-colonial theory and post-colonial studies in conversation with a number of fields that we'll discuss in the coming weeks, and amongst them indigenous studies and feminist and queer theory. Now, I'm not going to have time to draw out each of those connections uh, right now in the lecture, but I do hope that you'll keep Anzaldu in mind next week, in particular in the Indigenous Studies, because I think you're going to start to hear her voice research and resonate in interesting ways with some of the theoretical openings that she has in those fields. So, by way of introduction, uh, the book, the sort of, we read a chapter from a book called Borderlands La Frontera, which is a foundational text for a field that is called Border Studies. And the book is an attempt to recover and, in some sense, valorize the voices and languages and cultures and ethics of people who live on the U.S.-Mexico border, but also of people who live on any border, the borders of language, people who live in multiple languages, in multiple nation states, in multiple cultures. It's a sort of defense of border thinking and border ethics. And so right off the bat, a theoretical question I have about this text is the following. To what extent are the terms colonial and post-colonial helpful to describe the relationship between the mestiza subject and white America? That is, to what extent does the U.S. have a colonial relationship with Mexico? And if it does, then how does that relationship resound in the experiences of Chicano, Latino, and other immigrant experiences here in the United States? I don't really want to foreclose that question. I'd rather just leave it open. I think the fact that I put Anzal Dua on the syllabus kind of shows a little bit, shows my cards, that I do think she has much to offer to the questions laid out by uh, Saeed Spivak and other post-colonial theorists. But I want you to think about that. To what degree is coloniality a helpful framework for thinking about U.S.-Mexico relations? In the chapter we read, um, Anzal Dua is trying to both identify and in some sense champion a way of being and thinking that she calls mestiza consciousness. So mestiza um, just means mixed or hybrid, though specifically it means racially mixed. She's talking about a kind of mixture that is grounded in the mixture of races. And this has to do with Mexican racial theory that we can get into in the Q&A if you're interested. But we can just kind of translate that for now as mixed consciousness. And this topic of mixed consciousness, I think, leads us to one of the conceptual tensions of the text. She places mestiza consciousness in opposition to Anglo culture, 
But at the same time, she argues that mestiza consciousness is about moving beyond binary oppositions. Some sense, she kind of wants to have it a little bit of both ways. And so we might consider this the move of, of like under erasure, that you've seen a lot of people like using binaries that are inadequate and yet necessary. Uh, this, this is a move we've seen in, in other thinkers, that she's both trying to put it in opposition to some dominant culture and also suggest that it's a way of moving on, moving beyond binaries. And in fact, the text is full of binaries or borders that Anzaldúa is trying to transcend. For example, U.S. Mexico, Spanish English, poetry and po prose, you might have noticed that, gay straight. Anzaldúa is making the point or she's arguing that mestiza consciousness enables, and I quote, a tolerance for contradictions, a tolerance for ambiguity. And she places this tolerance for ambiguity in strong and opposition to what she calls Western thinking. And this is what she means in this quote. La mestiza, so the mixed woman, this person whose consciousness she's trying to talk about, constantly has to shift out of habitual formations, from convergent thinking analytical reasoning that tends to use rationality to move toward a single goal, that's what she calls the Western mode, to divergent thinking, characterized by movement away from set patterns and goals and toward a more whole perspective, one that includes rather than excludes. So when I was rereading Anzaldu of this lecture, I couldn't, but he, I couldn't help but hear echoes of Derrida here. And in particular, uh, Derrida's defense of play as potentially uh, something that is kind of an alternative to the totalization that he associates with the Western metaphysics of presence. And as I was trying to think through this, for me what was a very surprising connection between Derrida and Anzal Dua, I was reminded of something that Marcus said in his lecture on deconstruction. He came and he provided this quote in which Derrida talks about the role of having grown up in French colonial Algeria and the role that had on him being a sort of marginal, having a marginal oppositional relationship with Western metaphysics or with the Western philosophical tradition. And Anzal Dua, she also claims that this mestiza consciousness, this tolerance for ambiguity, is something that emerges at the borders, or we might say the margins, of national, linguistic, and ethnic identities. So it made me wonder, like, is, is Derrida a border thinker? Or the, to flip that around, is Anzal Dua a deconstructionist. These aren't thinkers that are normally brought together, but the reason I'm, I'm, I'm kind of posing this question because I, I want to see if I can break down the pernicious assumption that theory is only something that happens in these sort of rarefied, prestigious uh, Western academic uh, contexts. And so thinking about can we border Derrida or can we deconstructionize Anzal Dua is one way to kind of start to work at some of these surprising connections. And one of the challenges that I, I thought you might think for yourself is what would it look like if we used Anzal Dua as an analytical framework to analyze, say, Saussure, Saussure's take on language, or Hegel, and Hegel's take on the dialectic. That would be, that, that in my sense would be one example of new, new practices in post-colonial theory that are trying to break out of some of the binds that I called previously the location of theory. Okay, so now I'm just going to conclude, it was a brief conclusion. At the beginning of this lecture, I promised you that post-colonial theory would have something for you. I did. I promised you. And I, I, might have, I might have failed thus far, but there's still time. So I know some of you have to leave, but hopefully I'll get in, get in my promise before you go. And precisely, I, I want to say that it has something for you, even if you don't study the history of colonialism. So when I was thinking about this lecture, I had sort of two questions that came to mind. One of them is, what is it that I take to be the most inspiring and relevant parts of post-colonial theory for people who are working outside of the context of colonialism? And the other one was, what does Anzal Dua have in common with Said and Spivak? The reason I say that is because I kind of put the cart before the horse. I was like, I'd like to read these three together, and I had to figure out why, why I wanted to do them. And so the answer I came up with was this, and this is my kind of case to you. The ethics of situational thinking. Personally, what I find most inspiring about Saeed's work is his overtly political and worldly approach to scholarship. And in fact, all three of the texts that we read for day, today formulate in different ways defenses of what I'm going to call situational thinking. 
Said, for example, calls upon scholars to, he calls upon us to compile an inventory of ourselves. That is, to know, know ourselves by scrutinizing and foregrounding the personal and political investments we have in the things that we study. Likewise, Spivak urges Western theorists to mark their positionality as investigating subjects. And then Anzal Dua, with a different style, but I think a very similar message, states that the first step, a first step on the path to Mesisa consciousness is, and I quote, to take inventory, like Said, despojando, desgranando, quitando paja. Just what did she inherit from her ancestors? This weight on her back. Which is the baggage from the Indian mother? Which the baggage from the Spanish father? Which the baggage from the Anglo? So whether or not you work on the history of colonialism or the cultural responses to it, I encourage all of you, and particularly those of you who are embarking on graduate study, to compile an inventory, to, to mark the positions from which you approach your object of study. This instinct, this instinct to foreground the position from which we perform scholarship is what I'm calling the ethics of situational thinking. And it's something that I think post-colonial theory does particularly well, and I think it's the, tra the aspect of the field that travels most readily to other fields of inquiry. I hope you'll keep it in mind wherever your scholarship takes you. Thanks very much.